Thank you very much, Declan. Uh, I'd like to thank the Institute, the Landscape Institute and the Irish Direction Society for inviting me here today to speak. Uh, I originally thought I was going to talk about the OPW properties in Dublin, but then when I looked at the programme, it was an overview of Dublin Historic Parks and Gardens. So I hope Lewis from Dublin City Council doesn't get worried and think OPW is having a takeover here. <laughs> uh, I have 20 minutes to talk about uh, the parks and gardens in Dublin, to give an overview. And really, you could spend an hour on any one of the properties. So just bear with me when this is a fleeting glance at uh, the properties uh, in Dublin. And I'm really going to highlight you know, a few of the key properties and you know, just look at those from a historical context, what they use <coughs> uh, for today. And then at the very and the, the important people associated with those because there is a few characters you know in the whole course of the history of you know if you were to do a book on the history of Dublin parks that uh, keep cropping up across the various properties. So without further ado, uh, and I suppose just to set the tone, I know uh, most people here, a lot, most people here are a lot more knowledgeable than myself on some of these properties. But we have some people here who are not familiar with the historic period, uh, and uh, just to you know give a little. I suppose backward or background, you know, what is the different periods within the history of uh, the parks and gardens, you know, the Georgian period, the Victorian period, and then the more uh, Edwardian period. Uh, and, you know, we're, we, from our point of view, we're looking at the uh, Georgian period really from the 1714 right through to 1830s, you know, the reign of the four King Georges uh, in England. So that really is from our perspective. Then the Victorian period uh, is from the 1830s right through to 1901, there or thereabouts. Now you can see how the properties, you know, the features within those have, you know, a graduated uh, into the different periods. And then the Edwardian period, uh, you know, from 1901 to approximately 1939. Uh, there or thereabouts. So our parks, uh, you know, you, you can look at them in the, the square, maybe in a Georgian square, but the property with, uh, has, within it, the park itself has evolved over a period of time. So within that context, and then I've mentioned a few speakers, at the end I would like just to give a definition of what a historic park is, uh, because that's very important for us in, within the Office of Public Works, because that is our philosophy in how we manage the properties that we look after in that regard. And then at the very end, maybe just a few, throw out a few things that I think we could be considering as a group a, for going forward with regard to the parks. So I think that leaves me about 15 minutes now to give an overview of the parks. So just, a, I'm recently appointed as Chief Park Superintendent a, of the Office of Public Works. A, I've replaced John McCullen, so that's a very big a boots to fill. So I hope you bear with me while we just do a very a, a quick overview of the parks. This slide, and I'd like to thank Les, uh, he's given me a couple of slides of a uh, Dublin City Council aerial shots of them. Uh, within the Georgian period in Dublin, there's five main squares uh, that were established at that time. On the north side, you had Parnell Square and Mountjoy Square. On the south side, you have, you can see here in front of you, Merrion Square, St Stephen's Green and Fitzwilliam Square. Uh, the, these properties, you know, during the Georgian period, I look at those as we go through the top, but in the background there, you can see the Phoenix Park. And a, I'm not going to give a whole history of the Phoenix Park, but just very briefly, the largest enclosed park in Europe was established by a, in 1662, and last year the Phoenix Park celebrated 350 years as a royal hunting park. A, you can see then when the Royal Hospital in the 1680s, and the park became the size that we have today, a 1,752 acres. It was opened as a public park in 1745. And then the Office of Public Works as an institution in itself became involved in the management of the Phoenix Park and has continually managed the Phoenix Park since 1860, for a, except for a period of about six years when we moved government departments in recent times, but now rests with a, the... And you can see underneath there the a Rokes map, a, an early map a, of a, the Phoenix Park with the boundary outlined. I mentioned some of the characters. I mentioned people are important as you go through all the parks in Dublin, the historic parks in Dublin. You can't look at them just from a map, a cartograph point of view. You need to look at the people uh, and their influence. And uh, King Charles II, he was the person who was responsible uh, uh, for the initiation of the Phoenix Park. And this was to showcase a grandeur in government at that time. So, you know, we have few characters in recent times wanted to show their grandeur as well. But it was right through the centuries. A lot of people have these flaws, or maybe to our advantage, we, we've benefited from them. 
The Duke of Ormond, he was a person on the ground here in Ireland who was responsible for establishing the actual Phoenix Park. Uh, Lord Chesterfield, he opened the, the park to the public in 1745. And, you know, Chesterfield Avenue is named after him. Uh, and this was a huge thing, you know, to open a park to the public in the 1700s. Nathaniel Clements, another character in the Phoenix Park, and he was responsible for the layout of the parterres and the work of the Oris. So, you know, you have the Viceroy, you have, and then you have the landscape designer. You know, there's a mixture of characters there involved uh, with these properties. Uh, I just put in this map, Asser's map, uh, to give you, you know, the layout, the landscape layout of these sites. Uh, and you can see here the Phoenix Park and, you know, the main road in the park there, you can see the torturous line of the road. This is map uh, 1775, and it was rediscovered recently in the US ambassador's residence uh, in the Phoenix Park. But you can see the layout of the park, and you can actually make out the star fort uh, there in, uh, as part of the landscape of the park. By 1845, Decimus Burton had came along to the Phoenix Park, and the landscape had changed. Uh, he had introduced a lot of lodges, and if you go to some of the parks in uh, London, High Park and that, you will see, you know, the same influences there were being brought to Dublin. Chesterfield Avenue was realigned to what we have today, and the different uh, enclosures, if I want a better description, within the park, you know, the Vice Regal Lodge, Under Secretary's Domain, the Chief Secretaries, which would be the US Ambassador's residence. So you can see how the landscape is evolving. And, you know, at the bottom end of the park, as we call it, or nearer the city, you know, in, uh, from the uh, Victorian period, you have the People's Gardens. This was originally laid out in 1840 as a promenade ground. And this is very important, you know, that these parks were for to be seen, you know, uh, and I know Joanna will talk about this later on. But uh, the gardens then were laid out in 1864, uh, uh, la laid out as a Victorian garden. And you can see the bedding display here from the People's Gardens and uh, the Earl of Carlisle in the background. This is uh, referred to in the journals at the time. Uh, there were experimentations of the bedding schemes, which were, you know, the talk throughout Europe. So very, very important what was happening in these parks, you know, was being looked at abroad as well. And, you know, this was an area where the public could use and still is maintained as a Victorian park to this day. From a modern perspective, the Phoenix Park, you know, we all know the statistics, 1,752 acres. We have 11 kilometres of boundary wall. We a, a 22 kilometres of a roads, 28 kilometres of cycle lanes. Uh, and, you know, pitches, active and passive recreation. 20,000 trees in the Phoenix Park and over 250 events a year. We do a lot of road closures, etc. So, you know, we're all the time trying to balance the conservation with the modern usage of the park. Moving into the city, you know, the development of Dublin and the parks is really tied with the development of Dublin itself. And I'm not going to give a talk on how, you know, the Scandinavian development of Dublin. But you can see here Dublin Castle, the River Liffey. Uh, and, you know, this is Poole and Cash's map from 1610. There is no uh, St Stephen's Green at this stage. But you can see how it's starting to develop. The Green, uh, there was a hospital uh, where the present day Mercer, well, not pre some people here would be familiar with the Mercer Hospital, uh, and that was, there was a, a church very close to that, St Stephen's Church, and then from there, that's where St Stephen's Green got its name, and it was an area of land close to, basically, where Mar Mercer's Hospital was. The first public <coughs> park, uh, since uh, City Assembly had decided in 1635 that there was to be an area for the public uh, for the citizens to, and others to take the, to walk and take the open air. And this was 60 acres of marshy ground, uh, which was bordered by the River Staney on two sides. And this was the park as we know it. Uh, there was roughly 60 acres in extent, but I think NAMA even then uh, existed. And within uh, 30 years, they'd actually sold off 90 plots around St Stephen's Green. And you can see here in Bernard de Gomes map on the bottom right, uh, the present layout of St Stephen's Green where we have 27 acres. Part of those plots that were sold off, they had to build a part of the boundary wall of the Phoenix Park and plant six, horse ch or six, six sycamore trees. So I think they got a very good deal uh, on the plots around the Green. So that's how we've ended up with the layout of the Green. You would note there very little development of housing and you know the green was there before the, there was houses on the green which is quite unique. Again with Herman Moll's map 1714 
you can see the layout of St. Stephen's Green, a large promenade path bordered on both sides by a tree with a ditch to drain. A, the development of Dublin, Harcourt Street hasn't a, taken place yet, but the, the, the city is developing towards St. Stephen's Green at this stage. You can base, make out Oxmanstown Green, another open space, and you had Hoggins Green as well. And I think it's interesting, you know, the first recorded gardeners, I know we have some gardeners here today uh, from the Office of Public Works, but, uh, you know, even in those days we had to look after the plants and, uh, you know, the, there was uh, individuals who were paid to mind the trees that were planted. And a lot of people then didn't have property, so I don't know who would have been robbing the trees. But these are the first rega recorded gardeners uh, working in St. Stephen's Green. There's three main areas that were potential for a development of fashionable display, as they call it, in the 1800s. You had the Royal Hospital Kilmainham, the Phoenix Park and St Stephen's Green. And there was really one, at that, one of the parks at that time where it developed from a residential point of view, and that was St Stephen's Green. And that was to do with the development of Dublin. And rumour has it it might have also been to do with the location. It was upwind, so you weren't walking in a park with foul smells. The Georgian Square in St. Uh, St. Stephen's Green was very much a formal square and in the centre was an equestrian statue of King George II by Van Nost. Uh, you can see the four, par uh, four quadrants uh, tree lined. Now, the St. Stephen's Green today has you know, very much uh, changed, uh, it's more a Victorian park. But the green at that time was a very, very important area to be seen in. And this, you know, there was a lot of guides at that time. And Lewis's guide, uh, just a quote from it, in the walk may be seen in the weather, a great report of company, in the bow walk in particular, that would be the walk beside the uh, Shelburne Hotel, being considered in the same light here as in the mall of St. in St. James's Park, London, uh, the scene of elegance and taste. But that didn't last long, as any Irish story. Uh, and we have moderns and grave, you know, by the end of the 1800s, St. Stephen's Green had deteriorated. And uh, it was actually noted for the hunting of snipe. So it just shows you the drains had all blocked up. It, it was really a no-go area. And you can even see, you know, the depiction on the trees. You can actually see how the trees are starting to stag head, etc., within the scene. The Green became a private park. And, you know, this is very much, you know, like a lot of the Georgian squares, Fitzwilliam Square today is still a keyholder park. The Green was keyholder. There was an Act of Parliament brought in in 1814, and uh, the keyholders around the Green had access to, the, uh, to St Stephen's Green. This is a big change from 1835, where the park was for the people to take the open air. Uh, a lot of people disappointed in this. Uh, one of the you can see here this in Bartlett's engraving. You know the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, and I suppose this, there's a little story here as you, know, you go through the history of the Green, the importance of the Royal College of Surgeons. The Green was opened in 1877, uh, and you can see the, uh, you know, uh, Lord Ardalon was very much involved with the Green. Uh, the layout of the Green, uh, in modern park, eight, eight, over 8 million visitors. Lord Ardalon, uh, his statue was put facing the Royal College of Surgeons. Now, I mentioned there's key people within the Green and within the history of Dublin. And the Guinness family, I'm not going to do a talk on Guinness, you know, they're associated with different parks, Ivy Garden, St. Patrick's Park, uh, St. Stephen's Green. Individuals, Fuller, James Benjamin Fuller, an architect, worked very much with the Guinness family, and you know, involved in St. Anne's, uh, Ashford Castle, St. Stephen's Green. St. Anne's Park here, an aerial view. Today, uh, it's over 270 acres. Le Benjamin Lee Guinness, very much involved, uh, originally established it, and then uh, his son, Lord Ardlon and Lady Ardlon, uh, you know, refined the landscape more with the evergreen oaks and the more detailed features. Ivy Gardens. Ivy Gardens laid out as an exhibition grounds, 1865. You had the uh, gentry at that time, a company was set up, uh, the Winter Palace, uh, the large structure there. Ninian Niven was the landscape gardener, and over one million people visited the gardens in 1865. Today, you know, you have a, it showcased all the horticultural features at that time, and you have the Rosarium, pre-1865 rose varieties, the Cascade, the Rustic <coughs> Grottoes. A person who worked with Ninian Niven was landscape gardener A. Uh, William Shepherd. William Shepherd uh, was very much associated uh, with the Victorian and also the Robinsonian style, Palmerstown Park. Typical park uh, looked after by Dublin City Council. But you can see the features here from the Lawrence Collection, the water, the cascades, the rockwork, the ornamental railings. So 
Victorian at its best, you have then Herbert Park, which you'll see this afternoon, a 1903 when the Earl of, a, a, Earl of Pembroke a, donated the land, 30 hectares, for a, a public park, and it, has an, it had an exhibition in 1911 where two and a half million people attended it. The Herbert Park today, you know, the different features uh, belonging to it, and you can see the bedding, the water, etc. Herbert, or Herbert or, uh, sorry, Merrion Square. Merrion Square, you know, again, started as a Georgian park uh, in the 1700s with the square, it was enclosed. It has went through a number of different periods through its history. You know, the Catholic Church, 1930, bought it over, and then it was handed over to Dublin City Council. And I think Les will talk a little bit more about that today. Coming into the last park that we're you know, looking at, a, the War Memorial Gardens and Island Bridge, an Edwardian park. You know, this is to commemorate the 49,400 Irish people, men and women, who died in the war. Uh, you can see the lovely engravings by Harry Clark, uh, the books. You know, you can go to the War Memorial and get a record of a, the four, any one of the 49,400 people who died. We can print that off for you. Sir Edwin Lutyens. You know, associated a design, the layout for the War Memorial Gardens, along with a committee. A Lutyens, you know, one of the most famous landscape architects in, in England. You know, Haywood Gardens, a Lambay Island, a, and also Gainsford St Lawrence and Hope Head. He was one of the three principal architects involved in the War Memorials around the country. A, the, I suppose the interesting fact in the history of the War Memorial is that it was built by ex-British and ex-Irish army, worked side by side and used local materials, a typical of Lutyens with the stonework, etc. The gardens were opened in 18, 1938 uh, and were rededicated in 1988 uh, and is managed by the Oscar Public Works and the Trustees. And it's very much, you know, it's, an, it's a Lutyens park as opposed to, but Lutyens really was the Edwardian period uh, for uh, the arts and crafts movement. They, anyone who's familiar or not familiar with the War Memorial is uh, beside the Phoenix Park there at Island Bridge and it's a beautiful property to go and uh, you know we mentioned a uh, gentry who've been uh, there in the past and you know the Queen re uh, recently went to the War Memorial Gardens as part of her visit to the park. Uh, the, I mentioned the stonework you know and the book rooms in the War Memorial and all the stuff you know Valley Knock and Granite it's beautiful and it's a lovely lovely uh, park to go to. Just in case people think the OPW is looking after all these sites, you know, the, we have 33 properties around the country that the Office of Public Works and two of my colleagues are here a, look after a, you know, from a horticultural point of view. Within Dublin, you know, we can see the different sites, Garden Remembrance, Phoenix Park, Farmley, Botanic Gardens, Rathfarnham Castle. A lot of different properties and I suppose very much, you know, we have to look at them from a number of points. We look at them from conservation, public usage and tourism. These are the main areas that we're quite focused on. And just to give you an idea of visitor numbers, because you know, we're very much looking at conservation, but Phoenix Park has 12 million people a year pass through it. The visitor centre in Wall Garden has 102, well last year actually had 121 million. Dublin Castle, you know, 900,000 people going through. So these sites are very, very popular. Uh, if you take for, fall to Ireland figures, 1.3 million people have visited gardens in Ireland uh, roughly annually. So that's a lot of tourists to be looking at and very important for the economy here. The local usage, you know, very important for these properties to uh, engage with the local community, be it educational uh, activities, and this is a little summer camp we run in the Phoenix Park. We have also events in the parks, and you know, this is very, very important. Uh, this is, I won't say a typical morning in the Phoenix Park, but this is a morning in the Phoenix Park. And this is Chesterfield Avenue. You know, we get criticised when we close the roads in the park. But this is what happens when you close a road. You get people out using the park. And we often have runs of, you know, eight, 9,000 people on a Saturday or Sunday morning in the Phoenix Park. And this is very important usage because these are raising funds for different charity groups. And it's given people a place to work or to run. And it allows the city to still function. So the parks have an important role in that regard. The third aspect that we manage them from is, you know, conservation, a historic and our ethos within the Office of Public Works is we're, we manage under the guidelines of the Florence Charter and you know I just mentioned I'm going to finish up on the definition and you know just from our perspective a historic garden is an architectural and horticultural composition of interest to the public from the historic or artistic point of view 
And that's really what we're interested in. You know, we look at the plant, topography, the vegetation, the structure, the decorative features, water, you know, if it's running or still. And historic park applies to small garden, large park, it doesn't matter, you know, whether it's a formal or a landscape. And finally, uh, the very last slide, uh, Amy will be a uh, it glad. You know, going forward, what are the issues from a historic park's point of view? And I think from, from our perspective, you know, very conscious of conservation management plans or historic policy statements. We have a conservation management plan for the Phoenix Park. This is something that we hope to roll out for other properties over time. We want to establish these sites as models of excellence uh, in our management, you know, of historic parks and gardens. Uh, and this is something, you know, models of excellence in horticulture and management. Uh, there's great opportunities uh, with these parks, you know, within a tourism sector, but we, we have to at all times go back to what is our original philosophy. You can't make a fabulous tourist attraction and you've lost what the site was about, the ethos of the site. Uh, I think the National Gardens Inventory, I think that's something that, you know, a lot of work has been done and I think that's very important that that continues. Uh, none of this is important without skilled staff on the ground. You know, the, the, the qualities that the staff have, uh, their knowledge, that's very, very important that they have that knowledge and the continuity on the sites. And obviously, you know, meetings like this here today, it's very important for us to get the feedback uh, from yourselves, you know, to liaise with interested groups uh, that we're all working to the same agenda, uh, to the same ethos, uh, to try and protect these properties. So, thank you very much. Uh,